Um, my name is Anne Marie Anderson, and I am oral historian for the Southern Foodways Alliance here at the Center for the Study of Southern Culture. Um, we are a, a, a food media nonprofit and cultural nonprofit based at the University of Mississippi, and we document, study, and explore the foodways of the American South. Um, and so what that means for me and my job is I get to talk um, to people who make and grow and eat um, and serve Southern food. Um, and I get to share that, that job with people like Simone and Kelly. Um, and so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce them as well. Um, Simone DeLarmy is um, a sociology professor here at the university. She joined the University of Mississippi's Department of Sociology and Anthropology and the Center for the Study of Southern Culture in the fall of 2013. She specializes in migration to the U.S. South with interests in race relations, integration and incorporation, community development, and social class inequalities. Delorme holds a bachelor's in political science and a master's in liberal arts from the University of Delaware, as well as master's and doctorate degrees in anthropology from Rutgers University. Delorme spent her childhood in a Puerto Rican concentrated enclave in Harlem, New York, and later developed an interest in Latin American and Caribbean studies while abroad in Havana, Cuba, and Mexico's Yucatan P Peninsula. Shortly after her time in Latin America, Delorme um, conducted comparative ethnographic fieldwork among Puerto Rican migrants in Delaware and New York. The research for her first book, Latino Orlando, Suburban Transformation and Racial Conflict, which if you haven't read, you should, it's a very good book, focuses on Puerto Rican migration to Orlando, Florida, and the social class distinctions and racialization processes that create divergent experiences in Southern communities. Delorme's work has been featured in several academic publications, including Southern Spaces, Southern Cultures, and the Florida Historical Quarterly. And our other, um, our other panelist is Kelly Spivey. Um, originally from North Carolina, Kelly has lived in Savannah, Boston, and New Orleans before settling in her current hometown of Memphis, Tennessee. Kelly is an alumna of the Center for the Study of Southern Culture at the University of Mississippi. She holds an MFA in Documentary Expression, which she earned in 2021, and an MA in Southern Studies with a minor in Gender Studies, which she earned in 2020. She also holds a BFA in Photography from Savannah College of Art and Design. Prior to her graduate studies, she was a pastry chef at multiple James Beard nominated restaurants. Her current research and writing focuses on baking within Southern foodways and its intersection with labor and gender in domestic and professional kitchen spaces. Kelly is currently working on several projects, um, including the documentation of bake sales as a response to social injustice and Summer Avenue. Um, so before we get started in our um, conversation, I am going to um, stream through my computer three short films. Um, they all add up to be about five and a half or six minutes um, altogether uh, that Kelly made of the interviews that, that we did on Summer Avenue. I chose Summer in 2016 and uh, on the Chavez Center, it was only me for Middle East. It was Stone House and then going to Stone House Market and then Dara Hager Wholesales. Coming to summer, good to see different variety, different culture, different people, and it's getting better every day. My name is Abdullah Muhammad. I'm 48 years old and I've been in the USA since 1999. I came from Yemen. My wife from Morocco, I decided to make a family business. For me and my wife, we work together and the kids. We share the ideas. She brings stuff from Morocco, brings stuff from Yemen, like spice, raisins, and dishes, and decorations, things we get used to it, raised with it, drinks, milks, and other things, products. And also, I guess, stuff for everybody, just like international. I bring stuff from Turkish, I bring stuff from Jordan, I bring stuff from Dubai. I make my own ingredient for the spice. I have my own ingredient for the coffee. I get the spice from Turkish and mix it together. You grind the ginger, you grind, you grind the cinnamon and put it together. When I came to USA, I have nobody except me and God. I think down south is, it was the best place for me. You know, good people, they have good hearts. This is our hometown, Memphis. We've been in Memphis for a long time.
But we always wanted to have a, a restaurant for, our, for ourselves. But we knew it was going to be a hit if we would do something like this. There was nothing else like it. My name is Myrna Garcia. I'm a co-owner of Mi Tierra Restaurant on Summer Avenue. Been here for 19 years. I was born in Guatemala. We moved to Tennessee in 1995 where it was, the community was really small. There was hardly anything here. It's just a couple of restaurants in Memphis that serve Colombian food. This side of Sycamore View in summer, um, all the restaurants were open. Shawnee was open, the other places were open. Community for the Hispanics was really little. Now it has grown to where we serve people from Honduras, from Guatemala, from Salvador, from Puerto Rico. Once we open the doors, you know, we're really welcomed by the community. Full Colombian menu and full Mexican to 2 a.m. You know, our place are a lot of plantains, a lot of fish, not a lot of cheese. People, while they're having dinner or having a snack, they're dancing, listening to music, having a drink. We wanted to bring customers and, you know, make them feel like Colombia. Like going out of the country, going on vacation, once you walk into that door. We've been here for a while. Everything that we have done here in Mi Tierra, uh, we do it for our customers so they can enjoy it and they can have a good time. When I first came and then I saw the cottage restaurant down in the on summer down the street and I kind of like it. I like the name and like the way it look. I bought it the next day and then we've been open 365 days nonstop. We never closed. My name is uh, Tham Noon Thong Ampan. I was born in Thailand in 1947. I moved in, uh, from Thailand to America in 1971. So I've been in Memphis 30 years now. I'm just around here on summer, not going anywhere, and my house is down on the street. I have to be here at six o'clock and close at six. It's a lot of work, a lot of work. A lot of, a lot of work, a lot of fun. We have to do a lot of look around, see what the other people do, what the food they sell, what they look like, what the ingredients in there, and then try to remember. For the Thai food, I cook at home. You know, I, in, in Thai, I cook just like I cook in Thailand. And I happen to be me, I am come from the north, so I kind of know how. I remember what it is. I'm kind of proud of myself. And, and I create a new, new kind of food all the time here. You know. it, it's a lot of fun when you, when you run around doing the thing in the kitchen. You come up with a good idea. It kind of works, kind of good. Thank you guys for that. Um, so those were three narrators from our Summer Avenue project. And um, I thought that maybe, um, well, I'm not sure how familiar people who are on this talk are with Summer Avenue. And I was wondering, Simone, if you could maybe introduce us to this project. Could you tell us a little bit about you know, how you came to find Summer Avenue and why you found it to be a significant place. Yes, absolutely. Well, it's a documentary project where we're collecting and archiving oral history interviews uh, and creating documentary shorts to accompany those interviews uh, with representatives from different businesses, whether they be cooks or owners or management uh, on this commercial strip, which is approximately six miles long uh, in Memphis, Tennessee. And it's a very eclectic space and place uh, with a changing place identity. Uh, so what it looked like in the 40s and 50s, 
1950s is very, very different than the international presence that I found today. Um, it's the location of the first Holiday Inn in the country. Uh, Memphis's first McDonald's was on Summer Avenue. It definitely reflected the growing automobile industry with motor courts and restaurants fast food spots. Uh, and I became interested in it uh, while I was doing an oral history project with the Southern Foodways Alliance. And I was focusing on Latinos at the time in Oxford and Memphis. And I immediately realized there was a concentration on Summer Avenue. Uh, and so for personal reasons, even after the project finished, I kept going back for the food. Uh, and then the Summer Avenue Merchants Association decided to uh, try and brand the commercial strip as Memphis's first international district. So that renewed my uh, interest in, in the commercial strip and really led to uh, the growth in this project. That's great. I'm gonna actually link that project that you discussed as well that you did in 2017 I think um, in the chat I just did that too so if people are interested in that um, well you know I'm wondering if maybe we can get into the project itself and if you would describe this project tell us a little bit about um, the people and the places that you found while you were on Summer Avenue. Mm -hmm. yeah, and again, my initial interest uh, as a cultural anthropologist was the international presence, uh, realizing that a lot of the goals of branding and marketing this space and place and, and creating really a destination location was tied into migration uh, and this international presence, which really reflects what's happening across the South in terms of internationalization, demographic changes. Uh, so in terms of the narrators, I was very much trying to identify folks uh, that were foreign born and that uh, were contributing to the internationalization of this strip, of this commercial strip. Uh, but then I also wanted to include voices of folks that had been there uh, generation after generation, you know, their parents maybe uh, owned a business and then uh, they took over that location. So it was trying to get a combination of the new as well as, you know, what had been there previously in this eclectic space. Yeah, I'm thinking about some of those people, um, people like Andy Gaddis, who also has a migration story and his family history of coming to um, the Delta and then to Memphis and then also then migrating from downtown Memphis, his father's business to summer as well in the 70s. Um, I'm wondering if maybe you could share some of those narrators who you found um, particularly interesting, um, both of the both in the um, people who'd been there for a while, who, you know, had generations of family members in Memphis and newcomers, and maybe introduce the people who might want to dig into this oral history project to them um, and to their story a little bit. Okay. Definitely one of the people that, that really stuck in my mind was Myrna, who is one of the owners of Mitiera. She's a co-owner. Uh, she's from Guatemala. The other co-owner is from Colombia. And she's owned that business for 19 years. She's been there and has withstood the test of time. Uh, and she really stuck with me because, well, for one, she now owns that property, that building. And it's taken you know, quite some time to get to that position. Uh, but I think it reflects just the need and the growth in the community. 19 years ago, she said, um, she told us in the interview, for example, uh, that they introduced Colombian food on the menu and folks were really hesitant to try the food. They weren't familiar with that, which is why they introduced Mexican cuisine as well. So if you go there, you have this option of, of Mexican or Colombian. And that was very strategic because again, people weren't familiar with Colombian food, but over time, uh, there is that interest. People have uh, you know, gone to the space and place and are willing to experiment. And uh, as you saw in, in the documentary short, it's also a space uh, 
where there's music and dancing and celebration. Uh, the place identity, they've actually tried to make it look and feel like you're, you're back in Colombia. So you get this, this essence of being elsewhere. So that really stuck out to me. Um, and then through COVID, she said, you know, it was the support of the Latino community that kept them going throughout that time. Uh, so again, just being able to withstand the test of time, I think says a lot about that particular business. So that was of interest to me uh, in particular. Yeah. Yeah, and you could really see in that film too, which um, Kelly, I was wondering if maybe you could, you could um, step in with your voice and tell us a little bit about that experience both you and um, and Simone had in the process of like doing this work. So you, we have this big collection, but it's a lot of work to, to actually um, track down these people, you know, get to know them, get them to agree. And in this case, you already had this working relationship with with Myrna. Um, but I'm wondering if you both could talk about the experience of, of being there and filming and, and trying to build a narrative around this interview that you did with her. Kelly, do you want to start and then Simone? Yeah, I can go ahead and jump in and I'll apologize if I'm lagging a little, but <laughs> hopefully it catches up. Um, there were, the one thing that I, I talk to Amory about all the time is there's a lot of no's. And there's also a lot of, um, frankly, just forgetting <laughs> about us, um, which makes perfect sense because, you know, these people are just living their lives. Like we're the ones kind of intruding on, you know, their day to day. And, and sometimes like, I think with Queen of Sheba, we went a few times <laughs> and it was just kind of the matter of, of you know, keeping at it and being persistent, but also, you know, being really respectful of their time and understanding that like the project that we're doing is not at the center of their world. So, you know, we have to give a little too. Yeah, yeah. And it's a good excuse to get really good hummus, right? <laughs> Queen of Sheba yeah. is, an, is an idiot, uh, I'm sorry, a Yemeni restaurant um, that is uh, featured in our, our collection, but I'm wondering if specifically you both could, you know, speak to, um, I guess, building this narrative in in the um, Mitiera space, and maybe about um, being there that night. And um, I didn't, unfortunately, I was caring for a husband with appendicitis, so I couldn't be there. But um, I was wondering if you guys could talk about that, being in that space and filming and. Um, what it was like. Simone, I'm, I'm going to let you start. <laughs> Sure, sure. Um, well, for me as a cultural anthropologist, participant observation is really crucial to my research. Uh, so before we even started in the summer collecting the interviews, I had been spending time on Summer Avenue, just informally, um, you know, going to restaurants. Uh, I've been plenty of times to meet Tierra, late night to go dancing, bringing friends or family with me. Uh, so I try and build that familiarity first. Um, with the people in places, if at all possible, uh, by going and frequenting. Uh, so that's why with Mitiera, I think it was a little bit easier because I had interviewed them previously for the other uh, SFA project. So, you know, there was a willingness to let us come in. You know, we got there around nine o'clock, had time to set up to film. Um, I got invited to dance and I was on the dance floor. Uh, I made Kelly promise me that I would not show up in the documentary short. But again, I try and uh, just throw myself into the community and, and be a part of what's happening. Um, but there's also a lot of challenges that come with, with doing this type of research. Um, you know, it's, a lot of times it feels like you're soliciting where you're just going, you know, business to business, door to door, introducing yourself and hoping someone is going to give you some of their time because these folks are really busy. You know, they're in the kitchen, they're, uh, you know, Tom, for instance, the owner of the Thai cottage says, you know, he's there every single day from open to close. So they're really being generous with their time by sitting down with us. Yeah, and I think in terms of filming, you know, with me, Tierra, they didn't want me in the kitchen, um, which is understandable, you know, and I, you know, 
I, I had to respect that. I'm not going to barge my way in and have them be uncomfortable. Um, and I know later uh, Houston got some really great pictures in the kitchen. So I think part of that was just them understanding where we were coming from and, and our intentions. But, you know, with Tom, he could have cared less. <laughs> he was just like, I'm, I have work to do. If you want to come in the kitchen and talk, if you want to come in the kitchen and film, that's fine. But like, I, you know, you're going to have to follow me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering, I asked uh, Simone this question, Kelly, but maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the most, I think, significant or interesting people or places um, that is as a person who lived in Memphis, I think, um, you know, some of the most interesting people or places um, or things that you found on Summer Avenue while you were doing this field work? Um, Stonehouse Market was really amazing. And um, Abdullah was just so incredibly generous and led us into his warehouse. And I stopped by the store and filmed for a bit. And it was just, you know, let me make you a cup of tea and let's have a snack and just the most warm and welcoming experience that I've had. And, and they all were that way to, uh, to a certain extent. Um, I think one we did with Floricella at La Espiga, you know, she was again, really generous. We eat a lot of food. Um, I don't, you know, I hate to, <laughs> it was incredible food. So the food was a huge perk, but, um, but I had a really hard time getting back in touch with her to film, you know, that was one that I would show up a lot and call a lot. And, you know, we just couldn't seem to make it work. Um, so that, that was a bit of a surprise, but it was a good surprise in a way, because I did get some footage at least of the um, of like the pastry case and all of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, I'm wondering if maybe you all could talk a little bit too about um, maybe some of the, you've, we've talked a little bit about the challenges, but I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the surprises, things that were maybe happy or interesting that you found that people, you know, either did or said or, you know, places that you found. Um, for instance, I'll, I'll share, um, because I, I spent a lot of time in the field with both of you, um, helping to track down these people, um, eating a lot of guava paletas. Um, <laughs> and one of the things that I found interesting when I was setting, sitting in on these interviews was, you know, when, when you ask people, what was it like, you know, for instance, moving from Yemen in the case of um, Abdullah Muhammad um, or uh, a Floricella Medrano, the same thing. You know, what was it like coming to Memphis um, and deciding to live here? And both of them, you know, pulled out like environmentally, it was similar to the places that they came from, um, you know, people who are part of the global south and they're you know making these connections like climate wise and like you know the the trees reminded me of where i came from in mexico city or you know the weather like i lived in harlem for two years and i hated it because it was very cold um and that to me was really interesting these kind of like how this very specific memphis is a very specific place and these people who have claimed it um they are most definitely Memphians. Um, and part of that is because it reminds them of the places that they came from. Um, but I was wondering if, you know, for both of you, what were some, some interesting things um, that are conclusions that you came across? And, oh, I was gonna say, I can go first. Um, for me, um, one of the things that I really became interested in, uh, again, connected to the Summer Avenue Merchants Association's initiative to uh, brand that uh, strip as kind of the international district, 
that caught my attention. Part of that, they received a grant and they put up flags, uh, kind of banners that said Nations Highway, uh, another name for Summer Avenue. And they had flags representing different countries uh, that were supposed to reflect the businesses and the business owners. And there ended up being controversy over particular flags that were put up. Um, the Vietnamese flag, the Chinese flag, the Israeli flag, and from within the Latino community, there was some criticism. Uh, and so that surprised me initially. Uh, as a cultural anthropologist, I'm all about embracing diversity. I was really excited about the initiative, uh, celebration of food and culture, and really recognizing this international presence and, and trying to you know, bring people to experience that. Um, but as I listened more, I started to understand you know, some of the fears of gentrification, for example, uh, if this did become a destination destination location and revitalized. Um, I heard criticism about, again, those particular flags and what they meant in terms of symbolism uh, and representation. So I, I just wasn't expecting uh, the negative reaction from some folks, some folks uh, to this branding initiative. And as I asked sometimes during interviews or informally, uh, the folks that we were interviewing, it surprised me that not everyone knew about the initiative, um, but everyone was supportive and excited and, and talked about, you know, wanting more folks to come in and try their food. So they appreciated it, but not everyone was equally knowledgeable about what was going on. Yeah, I would say, unfortunately, Amber, you kind of stole my... <laughs> um, uh, when Abdullah was talking about the weather, like people moving, you know, to the South, because that's, that's a landscape and a weather that they know, like originally, I think you said he moved to New York and it was like, oh, I don't know this, but I do know I can find familiarity somewhere else. Um, and then aside from that, I mean, I think just the, the love that these people have for, for what they're doing, you know, like they're so grateful and, and so ready to like give back to the community and they've watched Summer Avenue change. And a lot of them feel like, you know, in Memphis, there is a kind of idea that summer's a dangerous place to be, but for them, it's not, it's their home, it's their business. And, to get another perspective on that was hugely important, especially for somebody who lived there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I um, I enjoyed speaking of Kelly. You saying we just ate a lot. It's, it's research people, um, and yeah, there's. I mean, these people are doing this amazing work and they're bringing you know pieces of, of themselves and they're you know supporting really vibrant communities i remember um jerusalem market right beside um queen of sheba restaurant we were talking to the man who owns that place and he said he was one of those really busy people and he was talking about the fact that um you know we asked him why did he pick summer avenue and he said because there there's a mosque really close to here and like, it makes sense because I have halal meat and these people, you know, they, they congregate and they have moved around their place of worship. And so this like <laughs> makes economic sense for me to be here because they're going to want to get, you know, halal meat and I'll be, you know, just a couple miles from their house. Um, yeah. So I'm wondering if maybe, um, do you guys have anything else that I haven't asked about specifically that you want to share about the project? I guess the goal is really to try and document um, some of the transformations as well. And I think one of the things I'd like to do more of is, is talk to those folks that have had restaurants for a long period of time and, and to kind of get a sense of when they felt the change. Because I realized with some folks, it almost snuck up on them. 
And the other thing that I think is really important is that these folks are responsible for the revitalization, you know, of this commercial strip. Uh, like Kelly said, you know, Summer Avenue has not always had the best reputation. People express fear, you know, in social media of the space of the place. Um, there's been blight. There's been um, other issues that, you know, the Merchants Association has been very active in trying to, uh, you know, bring up. And so, a lot of the immigrant community gets turned to as uh, you know, part of the reason there was revitalization. So I think that's important, uh, the contributions that these folks are making, uh, maybe sometimes without even realizing it, just by migrating and moving with their families. I think the only thing that I would add is if you are in the area and can go try some of these places, because I lived in Memphis for you know, five or six years and didn't try a lot of them and didn't get over that way. And it's some of the most incredible food <laughs> that I've had in the city. Um, and it's also important, I think, to make people feel like they're a part of a city and not just relegated to this one like international zone. Yeah, to your point, Kelly, when we went into um, La Spiga, Floricella Madrano, who's one of our narrators, um, when we went in there to do her interview, there was a man who came in and he, he was a white man who had moved from Texas and he was just like, he always came in he, because she had been there for 20 years and he always came in because it reminded him of um, the bakeries in Texas that he would frequent when he lived there growing up um, and he just told us all about how much he really enjoyed being there um, and getting these these pastries um, and and it was interesting to see like she had this she has been there for you know since 1999 I think they opened that bakery um, so this isn't new right this is these are people who have been there for a while um, as well so um, I am interested in um, maybe, so we have these eight interviews, they're really great, but I'm wondering about, you know, what do you see, Simone, for the future of this project? Um, where, where do you want to take it? I definitely want to develop the archive further. Um, this is really just the start. And I think now that we have the website and these archived interviews, it'll be easier to get other folks on board and willing to speak with us because they can see a product and what it's going to look like and what we do, as opposed to when we went in there, you know, in the summer and, and we were just getting started and we could show them examples of other SFA work. Um, but they didn't have a sense of what the Summer Avenue project would look like. So I definitely plan on growing the archive. Uh, the other hope is to get undergraduates, to get students involved in, in the project during summer research programs and research experiences. So definitely wanna involve uh, more, more undergrad and grad students in the project so they can have that experience uh, of collecting interviews, learning the process, uh, while also you know, getting to talk to these really important people and, and these folks. And the other thing is um, trying to see the transformations and change because there have been uh, initiatives. There was a grant that was won, uh, a complete streets plan that's supposed to help guide the future development of Summer Avenue. So there's all kinds of infrastructural changes that are um, you know, planned for the future. So I think there is the possibility of, of transformation taking place even more so. And I want to be able to document that uh, over time. So definitely wanna continue with the project, continue adding interviews uh, and hopefully getting more folks you know, on board and willing to speak with us. Yeah, we'll, we'll look forward to seeing that as it, as it transforms even further. It's, yeah, um, crazy um, how every single time you go down there, there's a new thing there. And it's, it's even, um, I think, to bring it back to, to the project, narrators talking about, like Tom from Thai Cottage, um, talking about, you know, like there's a Chick-fil-A coming in and, you know, Megan Medford, who is, uh, owns a roofing company there. She's a Memphian na native of, of Memphis. And, um, you know, somebody who she and the um, Summer Avenue Merchants Association, you know, 
being careful about like these big box stores that want to come in too, right? Because they, she is very, you know, committed to making these small business owners like her, like Tom, um, um, like Abdullah, all these people, you know, letting them have businesses to sustain them, themselves and their families and their communities. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see, um, I guess when you get a Chick-fil-A, you make it. Um, but I, it'll be really interesting to see how this, this international corridor, you know, blossoms, um, in Memphis, but, uh, Afton has done the, um, uh, she's posted the link to this project specifically, um, in, in our, our chat. Thank you very much for that Afton. But, um, where else can we, we learn about this project? Have you written about it, Simone? Is it going to be coming out anywhere? What, what's other, other ways we can engage in this work? Um, I've done an article about it, which will be coming out uh, in Gravy, and then it's part of a larger book project about international Memphis. So it'll be um, it'll be quite a few chapters about the history of Summer Avenue. Again, going back though, uh, using the archives in Memphis to kind of reconstruct the past, the development, uh, everything from desegregation causing white flight uh, and the blight, and a lot of the. Uh, devastation that happened and decline of the, the commercial strip to the revitalization. So there's definitely some writing and some articles that will be coming out and hopefully in the future a book about the project too. That's great. And you'll be able to read her article in the next episode of Gravy, which if you're a member, you'll get delivered to your mailbox. And I'm sorry. And you can also buy that at Hub City Press. So that will be um, dropping very soon here. Um, so anybody have any questions, um, for Simone or Kelly about their work? Um, we are happy to take those now. And I see one from Katarina. Oh, look at me. Um, where do we get those questions? <laughs> oh, here it is. Q and I, okay. Katarina says, thanks for sharing this interesting project. Can you all talk about how you navigated the challenges of doing this work while in the midst of a pandemic? That's a great question. Um, Simone, you wanna dive into that? Sure, I mean, in terms of the university, there were some regulations at the time. So we had to put a plan into effect um, that would uh, explain how we're going to keep everyone safe. So for instance, uh, you know, wearing a mask and making sure the equipment was sanitized properly. So the university had some uh, you know, regulations and I went through IRB uh, to get approval. So again, there, there were some policies in effect uh, officially to make sure things were, were going well. Um, but otherwise, um, I guess in some ways it was a risk, you know, just putting yourself out there, um, hoping people would be willing to talk to you. The places still had folks in it, um, you know, they were crowded. So again, there's maybe some risk in doing it, but also the goal was to try and capture how people are working through the pandemic. So I think it was really important to capture those responses as people were um, you know, still navigating the challenges of having their business closed for some time and, and only being able to do takeout, for example. So yeah, in terms of doing the project, just having to follow the policies and regulations uh, set out by the university to make sure we're following protocols and whatnot. But otherwise, just taking that chance and putting ourselves out there to get those stories. Yeah, I'll add on to that. I think we got lucky it, uh, because we were doing this work during the summertime and the, uh, you know, the first wave people were getting vaccinated. And so things were, were going in a pretty good direction. It was kind of before that Omicron Delta surge, well, Delta Omicron surge happened. So that was, um, I think one of, one of the things in our, 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 um, favor. But I think to your point too, uh, Simone, um, it was hard. It's still really hard for restaurants and they're still kind of like trying to dig themselves out of, you know, the, the difficulties that the pandemic brought on them economically. So any more questions? 
Oh, Afton has a question. She says, could you talk about oral history as a methodology and why it is useful? What role does film and photography play in the overall project? That's a good question. I'll, I'll, I'll describe what oral history is and then Simone and Kelly, if you guys wanna talk about, um, or Simone, you talk about it as a methodology and then Kelly, maybe you can talk a little bit about film and photography. Um, but oral history is um, a life history narrative. So it's an interview between um, two people, typically, sometimes more, um, an interviewer and a narrator or interviewee. And um, it's about that person's entire life. And usually in our case, it focuses specifically on food, usually their career. We were really interested here in, in how the connections between labor and migration and place, um, you know, what that does to someone's identity. How, how is that kind of like make a person's life experience. And so we do that through asking them all about their life. Um, and that's that what that's what oral history is. I'm wondering, Simone, if you could maybe talk about it as a methodology in your work as a sociologist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And for me, I use mixed methods approaches. So I do ethnography where I immerse myself in a community. If I can, I try and live in the community. I do participant observation where um, you're just kind of hanging out and, and doing what people are doing and, and taking really uh, detailed field notes to capture what's happening. And then in addition to that, I do the interviews. And with the oral history interviews, I find them very important because I get at memory, uh, food memories, for instance. Um, I get to kind of trace someone's history. So things like labor, education, um, identity, you get at all of those really important topics uh, when you go back far enough. Because I do both. Sometimes I do just semi-structured interviews where I want to know, you know, in the contemporary moment, are you experiencing discrimination? Um, you know, how do you identify? How have you become upwardly mobile? But when you go back, it you know, a little bit deeper into someone's story and into someone's history, uh, you can see you know, really the impacts of migration as well. Uh, because some of these folks, you see that they've made a very drastic change uh, at times in terms of uh, their career, their profession, their education. Uh, and sometimes food is something very unique because they can fill a niche. You know, they're, they can be the first Thai restaurant, uh, for example, on Summer Avenue or, or the first Colombian restaurant uh, because there's, there's that need. So food, you know, becomes an opportunity for upward mobility uh, when you maybe come to a place and you don't have the language to perhaps continue with the profession you had in the past. Yeah, that's great. Kelly? Yeah, I, I'll just say um, I start more from oral history than from film and photography. So, you know, that part of it is a lot of asking a question and then shutting up. And, and staying out of the way of the answer. Um, and I think for me, for the film and photography portion of it, it just adds an extra layer. Like you can't, you can, you might be able to hear Tom smiling, but like to see that big smile that he has is just, it just adds so much more personality and such an emotional connection, I feel like to, to the people themselves where you're not just listening to a voice that's maybe a little bit detached. Yeah, that's great. Um, if you guys can't tell, we, we developed a fondness for Tom. He was, uh, that was one of our favorite places to go. <laughs> um, Jay, Jay Williams asks, um, she says, thank you for your time today. And will you follow up with the current participants where they are now before you add others since it's been almost a year since their initial interviews? And I think that's a question for you, Simone. I owe them all a visit right now because uh, some of my um, students that I work with created postcards that they designed for each of them based on some of the photography and whatnot. So I need to stop by each place and, and present them with, with the cards that uh, the students constructed for them. Um, so there'll be that more informal type of visit. I hadn't planned on doing um, you know, a formal recorded interview to follow up. Uh, more so it'll go into field notes to try and, and you know, 
incorporate uh, the year since. Uh, but I think I would probably get right into including others um, right away. As soon as folks are interested, you know, I'm ready and willing to, to take advantage because they're just so busy that if someone says yes, I, I jump at the opportunity right away. But yeah, yeah. follow up with that. That's great. You talked, so we have we have a, a Yemeni market and a restaurant. We have a, a Thai restaurant. We have a Colombian and Mexican restaurant. Um, what else do we have? What other? Mexican bakery. Mexican bakery. So we have we have a, a pretty heavy concentration in um, Latinx folks and um, some folks from the Middle East in in this collection. But if if you know, there's somebody on this call who um, they want to visit Summer Avenue. Where are some of those other places that you are interested in, in finding? Where are some other um, restaurants or markets or, you know, other shops that somebody might find if they go there that you're interested in looking at? I really wanted to do an interview with Lotus. It's a Vietnamese restaurant. I believe it might've been the first one, um, but there was a significant population of refugees uh, from Vietnam that came uh, after the war, settled in the eighties. There was almost kind of a concentration of a community around Catholic charities, because a lot of the religious organizations were really significant in sponsorship. So that restaurant in particular caught my eye, just haven't had an opportunity uh, to get the yes to sit down with them. There was interest, but again, trying to coordinate uh, is a challenge, but definitely the Vietnamese uh, restaurant, only because that flag was a little bit controversial uh, and because I know there's a refugee population that was there historically. So I'd like to document that as well. That's great. Will we have any more questions? Thank you both so much. I know we're a little bit, we're, we got a little bit more time. Um, oh, we have two in the Q&A. Okay. Look at me. Okay. Um, okay. Katerina has another question. We have some more time for this. She says, I'd love to hear Simone reflect some more about food as a tool in place branding. How is food used by different individuals, groups, and institutions to brand Summer Avenue? Are some of these mechanisms more effective than others and are some potentially problematic? Yeah, and honestly, the branding initiative, um, I believe it was a marketing firm that they actually um, brought in and that, uh, you know, helped advise. So they were trying to think very strategically, what is the place identity of Summer Avenue? What can we use to make it a destination location? And restaurants have consistently been uh, kind of what's been talked about. I've seen it in social media, in newspaper articles, as I look at other sources, consistently it's the food that is drawing people to Summer Avenue. And there's been other research that's uh, that's been done actually on Summer Avenue. It was a PhD dissertation, uh, but where folks were looking, uh, they were doing kind of walking tours and the researcher was trying to understand whether or not folks and how folks would respond to signage that was in another language. Would they be willing to go into a space and place? So trying to see how folks that are native Memphians, uh, people who don't consider themselves foreign, uh, how they would interact with these spaces and places. And consistent in the research, folks were willing to be adventurous when it came to food. Other things, and they would talk about, you know, a mechanic, no, I'm not going to go in there. Um, other businesses, no, you know, there's a linguistic barrier. But for food, for markets, for restaurants, that was the, the exception in that project. So that really stuck with me and made me realize how powerful food is um, in terms of, say, a strategy to brand a place, to create place identity. And again, I think it's because, you um, there's a willingness to, to try food as opposed to uh, maybe a little bit more uh, hesitation to engage with international populations in other spaces and places. So the consumption of food ends up being, I think, very, very important in terms of, of branding. Um, let's see, let's see, I'm trying to think if there was another part to that. Oh, and in terms of it being problematic, um, Yes, I think that was some of the controversy and the pushback where folks were concerned as, you know, you make this a destination location, who is it for? 
is that destination going to bring in folks from the international community or are those people going to be monitored more so? Um, are you trying to bring in outsiders to the space and place and is that in return going to make uh, the cost of the lease or of rents increase? Is there going to be gentrification that happens in the community? So again, there's there's the very positive of exposure to food and, and to different culinary practices and cuisine, but then also, and then this is what I want to see. It hasn't happened yet. So it's going to be saying if there's change over time in making this a destination location, does it then impact you know, these folks negatively in some type of way? Uh, especially if they don't own their property, because not everyone owns you know, the building that their restaurant or their store is in. Yeah, Martin Zwires also has a question. He asks, or he says, very interesting. Thanks for your presentation. Simone, how does the Summer Avenue project relate to the previous work you did in Orlando? Let's see, in this project, I was very intentionally interested in food and food ways. Um, with the Orlando research, food emerged as being very important, but I hadn't expected it. Um, and it was very, very different in the way that it emerged in conversations. Or in Orlando, there was really this Latinization taking place where the soundscape changed. You hear Spanish more frequently than English. Uh, supermarkets closed and were replaced by places like public sabor, so spaces that were really catering to the Puerto Rican and, and larger Latino population and community. And I found that food in the Orlando case uh, was contested. So I found some of my interviewees, some of my closest informants, you know, really upset because it made them realize uh, that they had become a minority in a community where they had previously been the majority. So food and these restaurants and these supermarkets became contested spaces uh, because of the Latinization and what it re represented uh, to other folks that had been in the community for a long time. It represented change, transformation, uh, and minoritized status for them, um, which was different when I looked at Summer Avenue where it appeared like there was more of a celebration of food, uh, of this cultural difference, as opposed to uh, folks you know, feeling like their status has changed because of the presence of these places and spaces. So again, not intentionally looking at food ways, but it emerges in different ways as significant or uh, contested ground. Thank you everybody for um, coming and listening to a little bit about Summer Avenue. And thank you so much, Simone and Kelly, for you know making this excellent project. And thank you for talking about it. Thank you for heading it up. Thanks, yeah. Anne-Marie. And thanks, Afton, for dealing with all the behind the scenes stuff for the talk. <laughs>